Welcome to all our audience. As I said before, some joining us in the room and many, many more joining us online. Today, we are going to be discussing China's military rise and reflecting on the implications this has for Australia. Not a small topic, definitely not a shy and retiring one. And on that note, let me just make a quick level set question to begin with. We all know, and we can all agree, that China's military rise and the challenges it poses for a country like Australia can't simply be captured by the total number of dollars or yuan that Beijing is spending. Um, the political statements coming from Beijing matters, right, because that signals intent. Uh, the specific capabilities being acquired by the People's Liberation Army, that matters too, because that reflects an ability to deliver on Beijing's political intent and, and so on. So today, we're not going to be discussing everything associated with China's military rise. But the research our speaker today has undertaken in recent years does shed light on one very, very important part of the assessment's picture, the scale of resources that Beijing is mobilising. Um, just before introducing our speaker, I do want to flag that UTS Acri Research has touched on some of those other topics. Um, in particular, I would point to some work done by Michael Clark, our adjunct professor, um, who's now with Deakin University, and also by uh, Greg Austin, also another adjunct professor with us, who's just recently stepped down from a, um, a role at the National University of Singapore. Now, let's get on to it. Let me introduce our speaker. Peter Robinson is a professor of economics and dean of the UWA Business School. He's long had an interest in the Chinese economy. I actually remember attending conferences of the Chinese Economic Society of Australia with Peter. Um, it must have been around 20 years ago. So Peter's written on the structural changes in China's economy, the impact that the Chinese economy has internationally. Um, and more recently, he really has become the leading global expert in putting a value on China's military military spending. Um, we often imagine that folks who work in the intelligence and security agencies have access to privileged information relevant to some of these questions, but I'm pretty convinced that there will be a lot of those folks who keenly digest Peter's work and cite it in the briefings that they are providing to government. Peter's also one of those rare scholars who uh, has an unimpeachable academic track record. If you look at his publication profile, it's extensive. But he also re regularly ventures into commentary aimed at a broader section of the public, writing in um, outlets such as Foreign Policy in the US and the Australian Financial Review here. Peter, we are delighted to have you with us today. Welcome to the lectern. Uh, we're going to kick off with about a 15, 20 minute presentation. Peter will then join me um, on stage for some questions and then we're going to some questions from our audience after that. Peter, all yours. Well, thank you very much, James. Thanks everyone for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here and just share some of my thoughts. Um, hope we get plenty of time for discussion. Um, got a, a presentation here, a few slides. I'm going to whip through them because we don't want to dwell on, on any of these things and too much, we'll come back to them if, if you need to. So I'll just get right into it um, straight away. Now the rise, military rise of China, we're going to be looking at things from the numbers point of view. So, so James said, well, we can't measure everything by the numbers, but I guess the question is, if you could measure everything by numbers or to the extent we can measure things by numbers, what are the right numbers to use? So let's sort of look at that subset of, of questions. Now, um, James already mentioned the interest in this topic. Um, you know, the US uh, um, report on uh, China um, recently was sort of ex expressed uh, amazement at how, how fast it had um, developed new capabilities in its navy. So it's now, by some sort of simple counts of the number of ships, it's got the world's largest navy. Um, and, and um, of course, it's always had for a long time the world's largest um, number of, um, of soldiers. And more than that, it's also sort of leading in some technology areas such as AI and, and things like this. So the US has become sort of, um, you see this sense of, of alarm or amazement from, from US of just how quickly things have matured in China in terms of its capabilities. But also, as James alluded to, what politicians say matter, and China's politicians have been making statements, uh, particularly, uh, you know, around uh, Taiwan and um, the actions in the South China Sea have caused alarm. And we're seeing a lot of uh, developments as a result of that, AUKUS and the Quad are direct results of those kind of activities. 
Um, we're now talking about, well, we're talking about decoupling, which is the idea of putting up trade barriers to try and um, contain tri China, I suppose, would be one way of putting it. And of course, we saw our own defence review now is really aimed at sort of the, the new risk that's perceived in, in, in the region from China's rise. And, um, and they describe this as the largest and most ambitious of any um, military rise of any country since the end of World War II, which may or not be, may or be true, but the rhetoric certainly uh, is what's important here. So we look over on the US side, you see statements like this. This is General Mark Milley, um, and he's made the statement, combine the Russian and Chinese budgets, exceed our budgets if all the cards are put on the table. So he's saying that China's very, very big and, and it, comparable in size to, to the USA. So it's a new level of threat for the USA. Um, and that's kind of odd if you think about it because China's official budget is only $209 billion. Um, that's what they say it is when you convert it at market exchange rates. According to CIPRI, the Stockholm International Institute for Peace Research, it's about $293 billion, and that's just because when CIPRI do their numbers, they redefine things so you can compare across countries on a like-to-like -like basis. So some things are included in defence spending in some countries, and they're not in other countries. So then when they look at the same sort of things, uh, what's in and what's out, they get a number of about $293 billion. So there's some spending paramilitary forces which they include, which China doesn't include in their defence budget. And that's a bit bigger, but it's not, it's not a huge amount bigger. Um, but um, the USA's budget is $900 billion, right? So nearly a trillion. So it's still quite small compared to the US if we look at these official fig figures. And here's a, another graph showing the US defence budget and the next largest, 10 largest countries, right? So there's China, it's quite large, but it's still quite small compared to the USA. And you've got Russia, India, UK, Saudi, France, Germany, Japan, and Korea, and all those countries don't even add up to the, to the USA. And so you get statements like this from, um, this is going back a bit, but the statement's been repeated. It's still getting repeated even, even last week. There was an um, article in the well-known uh, in the foreign policy talking about this. We're actually bigger than the next 10 countries combined. Um, it could be 10 or 11 or 8, depending on which year it is, but it's, it's still very, very big. So the question would be, are the hawks too hawkish? Are, we, are they worrying too much? Is China really quite small? Is this threat exaggerated? And so I'm going to talk about that for a minute. If I get time, I'll go just look at three, how fast the defence budget of China is going. So the first question is, how big is the defence budget compared to USA? Mm -hmm. Second question is, um, how fast has it grown? The actual number for China is, is about $2 trillion, uh, two trillion yuan. So um, then what the, where, where this 293 number comes from is you just multiply by the exchange rate to get that in dollars. So why would you do that? Well, it sounds like a natural thing to do, and that's what people are saying. But these monetary values only really have meaning in terms of what they actually buy. Now, if you think of what we're doing here, if you're taking a 2 trillion yuan number and you're saying, well, what's that equivalent to in US dollars? Literally what you're doing is saying, well, if Xi Jinping took his two trillion yuan and he went along to the airport exchange desk and he said, how many US dollars will you give me for this? They'll say, 293 billion, sir, and he's got 293 billion dollars, right? And he'd go and spend that in the US. Well, if he did that, you know, he wouldn't buy very much and that's a problem. So when you compare this 293 billion with the US figure, you're looking at how much China's budget could buy if it was converted to US dollars and spent in the USA. Well, that's not what happens, of course. What matters is how much it buys in China. Okay, and so to compare with the USA, we really need to say, well, how much kit and soldiers and operations does the budget buy in China? And compare that with what USA's budget buys in, in the USA. And that's a number we can actually make a meaningful comparison with. And that's the problem with using these exchange rates. So I'll give you one example of that, a very concrete example. Let's just look at the components of the budget, and let's look particularly at the personnel component of the budget, right? So here's the breakdown of, of the two uh, numbers. There's about one-third, 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 and each country is spent on these components of, the, of, of military spending, equipment, operations, and personnel. So the USA is much bigger, but it looks fairly similar. They've got a big, bit more operations going in the USA because they've got bases all around the world. Right? So that looks um, similar. You can see, even if you just look at the personnel component, China's about one-third the size of the USA. All right? So if you look at that number... Converted to US, it's all in, in, in uh, US dollars. You'd say, well, it looks like when we use US dollars, China's personnel budget is only about one third as big as the USA. Right? Well, uh, we know <laughs> that's not true. We know that China has 2.7 million soldiers, right, or active military personnel, 
compared to the USA, nearly twice as many. So that, that simple number saying, oh, well, China's only spending this much on, on its budget and the USA's spending this much doesn't translate into real boots on the ground at all. And that shows you the problem with using the market exchange rates. And the problem with market exchange rates is it hasn't taken into account the fact that personnel are much, much cheaper in China. Okay? So how much cheaper? Well, um, just take a truck driver, for example. A truck driver in 55,000 renminbi, right, about $8,000 at market exchange rates compared to USA truck driver $40,000. So if you were just taking your salary, if you're a company, you're taking a salary for truck drivers and saying how many truck drivers can I get with this salary in, the, in China when I convert it to market exchange, I'll be five times more truck drivers in China. So your dollar's going to go much, much further. And if you're buying truck drivers, that's true. If you're buying, if you're hiring a nanny, that's true. If you think of living in the US and you're going to move to Beijing, you've got, I've got, you know, a budget for nannies, right? For my kids, look at my kids. You get a lot more hours of nanny service in, in China for the same money, right? And every tourist sees this, this um, effect as well. When you go there, sometimes your dollar goes a lot further. Um, and so there's a typo there. So employers only need about one-fifth, it should be not 1.5, one-fifth of a market exchange rate to employ the same number of truck drivers. And likewise, only about one-fifth of the market exchange rate to purchase the um, same number of soldiers. Okay? So we can do this um, not just for personnel. We can do it looking at the relative cost of equipment in China, the relative cost of operations in, in China, and work out a new, a new number which tells us in US dollars roughly how much is China getting uh, for its budget in US dollars and compare that with with the, um, with the USA. I'll skip over this one. When you do that, you get um, a graph a bit like this one. This is showing the evolution over time. Um, you, the blue is the USA defense budget. The lower bars there are the Chinese uh, defense spending um, in US dollars at market exchange rates, and the other line there is measured at this what I call military purchasing power parity, taking account the cost of things, how much the China's budget buys. And so um, it's about the equivalent of 470 billion US dollars. So quite a lot bigger than the 200 billion that we started with. Okay? And still a lot larger than the SIP resist, but of 290 billion. Right? So in this sense, General Milley's assertion seems somewhat accurate. Right? You know, if you look at things and what they actually, budgets, what they actually buy, then when you add China and Russia together, it is actually quite large. Because China itself is more than half of the US. So we, rather than this figure, the, the true figure is, is something like this, right? There's USA compared to, in this case, we've got China, India, and Russia in real terms, just showing. Um, so that's kind of a sense of how much real resources each, each country is putting into it when you measure it in US dollars this way. But um, note that uh, this is an important point which is often missed, right? So uh, here's the numbers again, right? It's USA, it's the same number. It's the 800 uh, billion number. Over on the left is the Chinese uh, SIPRI number, just under 300 billion. In the middle is the number that I've just generated, the 460 odd billion dollars. But look at the two China numbers, see how it's changed. The proportion of personnel in the middle one is much larger. That's because this new budget, well, what it's doing is it's saying, well, all these personnel in the Chinese PLA, we've got to evaluate them more in, in US dollars. And so, of course, that's taking up, uh, that, that, that costs a lot more. And so the re one of the reasons why the Chinese budget gets a lot bigger is because of this large number of people. When you value them, evaluate them at US wages or something closer to US wages, you get a much, much larger number. So China's big, but it's different to the USA. It's much, much more labor-intensive uh, military. All right, so um, that's important to note. I mean, um, it's quite labor-intensive the USA. The equipment budget, as we'll see, is uh, still only 37% of the USA. So if you just look at how much kit they've got, then China's still relatively small compared to the USA. And that might have implications to how you think about actual capabilities. All right, so um, let's just move on to the next one and look at this, uh, how fast has the Chinese defence budget grown in real terms? And again, it requires a little bit of economics here. This is, the again, what you get if you just go to CIPRI or some of the... Um, other websites and just say, well, give me China's defence spending in renminbi over time, and it looks like this, so it's getting up towards the 2 billion uh, renminbi number there, 2 trillion renminbi number there, and I've broken it down by its, its components. And you see it's all the time it's about one-third, 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 right? 
and say, well, you know, it doesn't look like much is happening, it's just growing again bigger. That's completely not true, because if you think about this, what's happening here, right? There's, there's two components there. Let's focus on equipment and personnel. So this is nominal spending, right? And personnel, you can see it's growing there. Now, who knows what's actually happened to the number of personnel in the PLO over the last 20 years? You know, Bates would know. <sighs> Don't put them on the spot. It's actually gone down, right? They've actually cut back the number of soldiers they've had. And so the reason that line's going up is because they've got to pay their soldiers more, right? The reason they've got to pay the soldiers more is because the economy is growing and they've got to compete with the manufacturing sector and other places where people get good jobs. So that doesn't, those soldiers don't produce any more military services. They've just got to pay them more. And so that's just cost going up, right? But equipment, if we look at equipment, well, that's going up too. So have equipment prices been going up the same as wages? No, they haven't. Equipment prices have been relatively constant. So most of that equipment growth is real. Right, so this graph it hides what's going on in real terms. Personnel is going down, but equipment is going up in real terms. And so there's the number of personnel going down over time. Right, these are the price indices. So you can see that the, the wage growth prices have been much faster than the prices of um, of GDP, overall economy, and and price of investment. Right, so you can use this kind of data to deflate those series, and you get something like this. Let's put two together. So on the right-hand side, you've now got deflated spending, right, in constant dollars. And you can see there the personnel numbers are going down because the number of personnel has gone down because you're measuring it in a constant dollar, 2015 uh, dollars. Also, 2015 RMB. And um, you can see there the real growth in, in equipment has been quite rapid. So when we look at the, what's happened over time, it's been the really the interesting part of the growth in the Chinese budget has been on the equipment side. It's been massively, massively investing in equipment. In fact, the growth of real equipment has been over 10% per year for 20 years. So double-digit double growth in real equipment, inflation adjusted, uh, for 20 years. So um, if you just index these to one and compare with the USA, then you've got the two blue lines show USA growth of its defence budget and USA's growth of its equipment in real terms. And then you compare that with the two red lines, which is Chinese overall budget growth and China's equipment growth. And you can see it's all been in equipment and the equipment's been rapidly catching up with the USA. So although it's only 37% of the USA's equipment now, it's come from nowhere, right? It's got to 37% very, very quickly, and it will very um, soon uh, catch up if it carries on growing at the same rate. This just to give another perspective on that equipment growth, um, just comparing China with a bunch of other countries. So we've got France, Germany, Italy, Russian Federation, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. And we look at them in 2000, they're all about the same. And we look at them at two, this is equipment, real equipment spending in each country. Look at them in 2021, you can see China's actually just about as large as all those other countries put together, including Russia. So China's equipment budget is absolutely massive, right? Not as massive as the USA yet, but it is absolutely massive in global terms. So that's what's changed. The story of China's rise has not really been one about increasing defence spending uh, all over and just sort of more of the same. It's about been cutting back the number of, of personnel and investing very heavily in equipment and it's catching up, closing that gap with the USA, but it's still only 37% of the USA in terms of equipment. The rest of the gap, the sort of 49% um, of the USA, I think, was, is, is all its personnel, which is not really strategically that important any, anymore for China. OK, so um, a massive increase in equipment per person and, and um, significant catch-up in China. So that's where I'll stop. Um, James, back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Peter's landed on a few very important findings there, right? So the first one is this, that China's defence budget is buying a heck of a lot more capability than is commonly understood. And the second is that uh, the big increases in China's spending haven't been on bodies, number of soldiers. It's actually been in the, the equipment that's being purchased. So think China's military modernisation, right? Not the expansion of its forces. So those, if you're sitting in Canberra, both of those findings, <laughs> you can't pretend away, right? They are real issues that you, um, that you have got to respond to. So I think um, Peter's done everyone a service there. Now... 
Pet, I just want to start off with a couple questions, digging into the numbers a bit and making sure we're just putting them in context. And I'm sure you'll be supportive of this as well. Because my own view is that one of the problems with Australia's discussion of China is not that people lie, <laughs> right? It's just that um, you get a certain section of facts or findings presented, uh, some other facts and findings are uh, obscured, and all of the facts are not set in very relevant context. So I want to make sure that we get our, our con context right. In, here's the first question. In an international comparative context, so when you compare China with other countries, can you just clarify, is there anything unusual about China's cost-adjusted military spending being significantly greater than its spending when valued at market exchange rates? I mean, I think your numbers are, when you to do those cost adjustments, it works out at $476 billion. When you don't, when you just value it at market exchange rates, it's $292 billion, right? So not quite 2x. Um, now, if I remember correctly, you had an article in the Review of Income and Wealth in 2021, right? And you looked at a whole bunch of countries. And when you look at India, which comes came in at third in terms of total military spending, and Russia, which came in at fourth, when you do that adjustment for India and Russia, um, they're actually – there's a 3x or more than 3x difference, right? So that's the first question. Is there anything unusual about this big jump when you value it in cost-adjusted rather than market exchange rate terms? Yeah. Thanks, James. Is the mic on? Yep. So um, – the answer is no. So China's uh, and every other country that has uh, a very large labor intensive military, you'll find a larger adjustment, right? So it tends to be mostly on the cost of labor, but if equipment's cheaper, then, then you'll get that as well. Like Russia, you know, has a, it's, it's very interesting for Russia because Russia, people looked at Russia's defense. If you look at Russia's spending um, in US dollars, it's not that big, right? If you look at Russia's economy in US dollars, it's absolutely tiny. But they've got lots and lots of soldiers, right? And they've got lots and lots of tanks. And this is kind of a big debate at the time of the Ukraine war. How big is actually is Russia? And actually, how big is Ukraine? Because Ukraine also um, has had a lot of soldiers, right? And if you value them, at the, at the, uh, value them uh, compared to Russian soldiers, the, the gap looked smaller compared to Ukraine and Russia than, than what people were saying, just looking at market exchange rate numbers. So India is another one that's, a, um, that's also a quite a large military when you make these adjustments. Interestingly, what happens over time is as countries develop, wages go up. And this, um, what I call the military PPP, or even just any kind of purchasing parity, power parity measure, tends to coincide better with, with the market exchange rate. So the poorer the country, the bigger the adjustment you'll get because labor's cheaper. Right? Yeah. Okay. So two key findings there our audience should keep in mind. So one, this increase in real Chinese military, in, in Chinese military capability is real, right? Let's not pretend it's not. But also remember that that big increase isn't unusual. It happens for India and it happens for Russia as well. That's fair to say? Um, well, it depends what we mean by increase. So we can talk about increase over time, right, in real terms. Or we can say how much do we need to adjust this number by to get a bigger Bigger sense. So the amount you adjusted number by is would be similar for other countries that have similar level of development to China. Yeah, but well, and one other thing is uh, is um, the U.S. Uh, senator from um, um, Alaska, I think it was, um, came out and released a number from the Pentagon saying that they thought the Chinese they think the Chinese budget is nine hundred billion dollars or seven hundred seven hundred billion dollars, almost as big as the USA. And so that's another type of adjustment, which is how much of China's military spending is off the books. Right? Sure. Yeah. So when people try to do this, they're taking out two things: is, is off the books spending that's not really being, you know, reported, and that might be civilian military fusion stuff, and then also, well, we're getting the numbers right in terms of the stuff that I do. They're yeah. two separate things. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Now, the second point I just wanted to clarify the context on. Um, it seems to me, and and push back if you think I've got this wrong. If we're going to express China's military spending in cost-adjusted terms, it seems to me pretty appropriate to also contextualise that um, with a denominator that's also in cost-adjusted terms. So, to make this a bit more concrete, according to your estimates, China's military spending is now uh, cost-adjusted, is 59% of that of the US level. Now, according to the latest estimates from the International Monetary Fund, 
China's economy, its GDP, is actually 128% of that of the US level. So, you know, despite being nearly one third bigger than the US, its spending on its military is actually just a little over a half. And as I understand it, as a proportion of its, its economy, China actually spends less on its military, not just in the United States, but on Australia, India, Vietnam, a host of countries in the region. So the question is this, and I'll deliberately put it a bit provocatively, has China's sin really been just to rapidly grow its economy? So um, China's, yeah, what you say is absolutely correct. So if you look at China's total defence spending, as a fraction of its GDP, it's not excessively large. In fact, it's been slightly declining. It's around about 2% and getting a little bit less. So China's been able to build up a big military at constant percent of, of, of GDP, um, uh, much smaller than the fraction than, than the US has, which has ranged between 3% and nearly 5%. So, so that's absolutely true, right? Um, and as it got, why would it, why would it do that? Why would it not take advantage of its growth to reduce its... Um, military spending, right? Well, it's got real needs. You know, it's got um, oil imports from um, the Middle East have become far more important. That's a very long supply chain. So it's got to protect its economy by having, you know, strategic interests in all the way from the Middle East through to, through to um, China. That means um, naval capacity in the South China Sea as well as right around into the Indian Ocean. That means aircraft carriers, right? That means air support. And so forth. So there's legitimate reasons why you'd expect China to continue investing um, in its in its military. So, but what I've tried to show there is is the is the change, right? And so, whether it's the interests are legitimate or not, it still gives China all sorts of strategic capabilities, right, that it didn't have before. And so that's something that the rest of the world still has to take account of. Yeah. Yeah, and just to be fair to our defence minister, he's on the record publicly saying several times that, you know, the Australian government doesn't, uh, it, it accepts that other countries have the right to choose how much they spend on their military. So it's not a um, an issue in that sense. I just wanted to make sure we got the context right. Okay, but a final context question for me, and this relates to that second finding, the rapid ramping up of China's military modernisation, so the, the spending on, um, on equipment. Um, actually, I keenly read your commentary piece just published just last week um, where you said that China's while China's overall military spending had increased threefold since 2000 its spending on military equipment had increased nearly eightfold and, and your numbers today um, reinforce that the question I have there I get the trend is confronting but isn't that eightfold increase mostly just a base effect what I mean by that is China started with a military that was hugely bloated um, in terms of the number of personnel, uh, a massive ground force and army. Now, that's completely unsuitable for the strategic circumstances that Beijing and indeed Canberra faces today, right? I think we can all agree that any future conflict in Northeast Asia is primarily going to be a, a sea and an air one, not a land one. So even now, while China's total military spending, according to your numbers, is 59% of the US level, its, Chinese, the, the, its military equipment spending is just 37% of US levels. So if I've got that right, China's spending 23% of a significantly smaller budget on military equipment, while the US is spending 36% of a much larger budget. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, but if I'm a Washington hawk, and I have been accused of being a Washington hawk, um, if I was a Washington hawk, I wouldn't be looking at percentages, right? I'm simply going to look at the number, right? That's all that matters. So the question, you know, of what is the strategic threat to the USA in its interests in the um, Western Pacific from China's growth, right? And, and um, you know, it's not a crime to have a, a big military, but it, but it depends what you want to do with it, right? And so that's the question they've got to ask. Ten years ago, what they could do with it was very limited, right? Today, what they can do with it is is much larger. And so simply the percentages don't matter, right? Um, see, where you're coming from, perhaps um, back in the old days, an arms race was defined as a rapidly escalating um, increase in the fraction of spending on the military as a ratio of GDP. So, you know, if you look at the pre-World War One or pre-World War Two, you see this, you know, 
arms race, uh, Germany and, and, and the UK building these battleships, dreadnought battleship class massively, just about broke their economies uh, just prior to World War I. And you see some of the big build up in, in uh, World War II. Uh, I, you know, we don't have an arms race of that kind right now, for sure, right? But nevertheless, the strategic situation is changing in ways that we're not familiar with. And I don't think there are good historical analogies to what we're looking at right now. So it, when we look at China's capabilities, yeah, it's managed to increase its capabilities a lot without changing that ratio because it's been able to substitute away from troop base to, to, um, to equipment that better suits its current strategic needs, but also um, is um, more of a challenge for USA if, in terms of protecting its interests if China so chose to use those capabilities in certain ways. So, look, there's two points that are both relevant and both correct here, right? So, as Peter says, if you're sitting in Washington or if you're sitting in Canberra, the absolute amount of capability you're able to purchase matters, right? Or the Beijing is able to purchase matters. I think the contextual point is also to remember that if you're sitting in Beijing and you're listening to Washington or listening to Canberra talking about this, you're thinking, hang on, you guys are spending a whole lot more than we are and it's particularly on, on equipment, and yet you're accusing us of modernising our military. Well, what about you guys? So that's the, the insecurity spiral I do worry about. And actually, Peter, my next question comes to that, and you've, you've touched on it in terms of the arms race. Beijing's not shy of accusing Canberra of engaging, promoting an arms race via the AUKUS agreement. Now, Canberra says, hang on, you know, we're not the ones who are engaged in the biggest military build-up in the region since World War II. Um, you know, Canberra will say we're transparent about acquiring nuclear-powered but conventionally armed submarines. Um, we're transparent about what we're trying to achieve. We're not trying to dominate China. We're trying to support a, a strategic equilibrium in the region. And moreover, there's plenty of countries in the region who don't seem very alarmed. India, Philippines, Viet Vietnam, Singapore. They were quite comfortable with what Canberra's doing. So, Peter, my next question, it's a bit of a normative one, and it's getting away from your research, a bit unfair in that sense, but do you have any policy advice for Canberra and or Beijing in terms of how we might avoid an insecurity spiral and a regional arms race? Okay, thanks, James. Yeah, good questions. And, and I will I usually start presentations like this by saying I'm not a security expert, I'm not a de defence expert, um, uh, international relations expert, um, and I'm not a defence expert. I know nothing about uh, defence particularly, right? But um, I'm just an economist, right? But still, not given just an economist, Peter. Come on, give yourself given some the uh, yeah, given the nature of the thing, I, I feel some responsibility to try and understand some of these issues, and and, and I do have opinions about it, though they may not be entirely, uh, you know, clear. But let me try and clarify what I, what I do think. Um, I think, first of all, in terms of Australian defence policy, you've got to cut out the noise, and Australia has got to look, assess its risks and just do what it's got to do, right? That's the first thing. Um, we spend somewhere around, I can't remember the number, but somewhere around about 2% of, of defence, on uh, of GDP on, on defence, which is pretty conventional. Um, so I think the challenge for Australia really is, well, firstly, how can we send, spend that 2% better, right? I think there's a lot of noise about that right now, and it's probably accurate, so... Given we do spend so much, what's the best way to spend it? That's the first thing. And then, but to answer that question, you've got to answer the other question is what sort of defence policy do we want? So, what are our strategic interests? And there's two views going around, I think, um, about that, um, characterised this way, but audience may have a better sense of this than I. Two views going around is that one is that we should just sort of, we uh, the job of defence is to protect Australia. We're not interested in, in other countries. We're not keep our noses out of it. We're going to put a missile ring around Australia. We'll have submarines to protect us, keep our interests, uh, just a sort of a first line of defence, um, and just do that really well. And and don't rely too much on the USA, but, you know, we're going to import weapons because we don't have a big industrial base, so we need allies. The other view, and, and I have some sympathy with this, is that you can't really just have um, secure yourself with a ring around your fort. You've, you've got to worry about the broader region and you need stability in that region. So you've got to be willing to maintain and talk about you know, values, things like freedom, navigation, and these kind of things in that region. If we believe in those values, then we're prepared to put some money behind that. So can you really just have um, security without sort of having some capacity to influence decisions in the region? 
And of course, the less we engage with the region, the less influence we would have. So I guess the challenge for that, the Australian government there is, as it it looks to project force or have the ability to project force further from our shores is to somehow have to also reassure Beijing that, um, you know, this is not, lo doesn't mean Canberra's locked into a future conflict with China and so, which would start off that insecurity spiral that I was mentioning before. Yeah, I mean, like, let's be clear, Can Canberra's not going to get into a conflict with China, right? So the only way we get into conflict with China is by aligning ourselves with the USA kind of... Um, strategy uh, but that that's certainly possible yeah okay. um, so so in terms of our relationship with with china um you know it would depend that probably mostly depends on on how close we are to the usa okay all right final quick question from me uh and then i'll come to our audience and that includes our audience online so our online audience um please do jot down your questions in the chat box Okay, Peter, here's my last question. What do we need to do, be doing, in your view, beyond a military response? I mean, given the huge increase in Chinese military spending, is hoping that, to use Penny Wong's language, calm and professional diplomacy might maintain a stable relationship with China, is that just naive? Um, you know, do we need to face some simple, hard facts here? Um, aside from building our own military, for example, should we be trying to aggressively decouple our economy from China? I mean, there's plenty of folks in Australia who make that exact argument. I don't think that's the view of our foreign minister. It seems to me our foreign minister thinks those economic linkages and interdependencies are actually useful um, sources of stabilisation, even if they don't, of course, they don't prevent a conflict, but they are more likely to make it less likely. I think that's Penny Wong's view. What do you think we should be doing on the economic front? That's really tapping into your expertise as an economist. Sure, yeah. Should we be embracing those interdependencies with China or should we be really trying to shut them down? No, I think we should be embracing them full on. I think, uh, so let me characterise this. China's a beautiful country, right? Russia's a beautiful country, right? Beautiful histories, um, culture, all this stuff. I mean, but the, we have problems with the governments, right? And I think it's really helpful to separate those two things in our mind and think what, what we want out of these relationships. The governments have their own agenda, both those countries, they've got particular insecurities. You have to be mindful of those. But I think being mindful of that, then you want to try and engage as much as you can with the people of those countries. Um, and as we were discussing just beforehand, I mean, economic activity is good. Um, it's, we don't, Neither James and I were sort of agreeing that we don't think that um, putting up tariff barriers, well, we're not going to influence China much by refusing to export to them or refusing to import from them. And we saw that when China put up uh, trade barriers against Australia, it didn't really have much effect economically. Australia economy, Australia's economy didn't really um, didn't really miss a beat. So, so, but I think maintaining those cultural exchanges and economic exchanges and business partnerships, you know that. That soft power that is really, really important, right? So um, I, I understand that in the US they want to now decouple in, in the following sense, in the sense, well, that we really got to, they really need to be a little more careful about the exporting of certain technologies that they think can be militarized. USA strategy is never going to be bigger than China. China, you know, if it carries on, if it doesn't get stuck in the middle inco income trap, which is another thing we've talked about then it has the ability to be a much larger economy than the USA, right? And so USA's strategy is always going to be trying to maintain a technological edge. So that's why they want to do that. And that's why they're probably scared to share technology with us. Um, so I can see certain arguments around technology um, restrictions, but I think in terms of everything else, you just want to I engage as much as possible. Okay, thank you, Peter. I might go to our in-person audience today first. Any questions? Sure. I just want to introduce you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Bates Gill. I'm um, the head of the Center for China Analysis with the Asia Society. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. Uh, two, two quick questions. One, based on what you could apply as an average in uh, annual growth in defense spending by the United States and China, and um, calculating on the basis of your cost-adjusted figures, when would you expect the Chinese defense budget to overtake the United States in cost adjusted. Um, that's question one. Secondly, but this is more important, I think, um, I was very glad that you got to the point of intention at the end, because the figures are excellent and they tell us some interesting things about trends, um, but they don't answer the kinds of questions that James was trying to get us all to think about. Um, 
because it all boils down to intent. There is no doubt uh, that under current circumstances, in let's just say a conflict across the Taiwan Strait, uh, that China could focus enormous amounts of kinetic and deadly force uh, in concentrated ways that's going to make any intervention by any uh, foreign power or even by Taiwan itself very, very difficult, extremely difficult. Um, and that has nothing to do, really, with the overall defense spending or where that, you know, what that means and the rest. It's, it's a specific contingency that's extremely dangerous, much more dangerous than it was um, 10 years ago, and it's only going to get more so. Um, so if I were a defense planner in Canberra and or in Washington, I can I know for sure in Washington they're thinking this way, and surely they are in Canberra. Uh, uh, the budget figures are interesting, but the real problem is how to deal with specific contingencies, uh, and it's in those contingencies that the budget numbers have begun to apply in ways that make it extremely difficult um, and raises all sorts of new questions and problems about what to do about it. Yeah, so the answer to the first question is just a quick rough calculation in my head, but 15 years probably, right? That's assuming that China stays on track in terms of its growth, right? Uh, but I think that's the big risk for China. If the economy tanks, as we're seeing, you know, if this tanking, it's going to take much longer. It, it may never catch up, right? But it, on the basis of that historical trend of 15 years, it would be similar size to the USA. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. So what do these numbers tell us? Well, it tells us China's big and it's got all sorts of new capabilities that it didn't have before, and that raises all sorts of contingencies you've got to plan for that you didn't have to worry about before. And that then raises issues of, well, how do we work with India? How do we work with this for the US? How do we work with India? How do we work with Australia? How do we work with Japan? Which is the um, rationale behind these alliances that we're now seeing. Yeah, I think it's exactly what's going on. Perhaps one more question from the audience. Yep. Um, thank you for your Thank you for your very um, insightful analysis. Uh, just uh, a comment, and I'm just looking for your interpretation. So, in the uh, in the uh, work report by the premier in a couple of days uh, couple of days ago, so the uh, the budget on defence uh, will be increased to seven point two. Percent, so that's that would be higher than the GDP growth. Uh, that's five percent. So how would you exp uh, exp interpret this growth? So who's are we talking about? Chinese budget or Australian? Yeah, China's. Chinese budget, yeah. Seven, seven yeah. two point percent increase in defense. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, like how would I interpret that? I'd interpret that as that um, the Chinese leadership has a problem in the sense that GDP growth is slowing, right? But they've got a military establishment that they need to feed. Right, and it's very hard to wind some of that sp annual spending back because they've got certain needs. So they, they need to, you know, it's like me as a dean of a business school. I've got certain budget and certain things I have to spend on next year, and sometimes that means I go into deficit if um, if I don't get enough students to pay the bills. Right, so he's in a similar situation. He got less money to pay the bills now, but he's still got a big military he needs to feed. So, so he's going to make cuts elsewhere, um, and and maintain that level of military. I wouldn't see much more in it than that, except it's sort of a, a budgeting position. What's the alternative? The alternative is you make a big announcement and say, well, we can't afford this military anymore. We're going we're gonna to cut it in certain ways. Um, and that's, I think, a difficult thing for him um, because it's, uh, it's also about employment, right? making jobs for people. Um, there's all sorts of industry connected to that. He can't afford to wind back certain industries right now, which he's trying to subsidize. So I think there's a lot of political reasons why you expect to see that. Yeah. And Marina, I can't resist jumping in there. Um, in fact, it's even more benign than that because that 7.2% increase is actually a nominal number where the Chinese government is targeting a 5% real growth number in GDP and they're expecting inflation to be about 3%. So in other words, what they're effectively saying is we expect China's military spending this year to shrink as a proportion of the Chinese economy, right? 7.2% versus 8% of the economy as a whole in nominal terms. The other thing I'll say on that number, you know, actually I saw this um, line the, when those numbers were released. It seems to happen every year that people will point to those numbers and say uh, China's engaged in a huge military build-up. That was the, the words that we used in the Australian newspaper. Uh, I noticed last year China's military spending went up by 7.2%. 
that got a lot of headlines, but its diplomatic spending went up by more than 16%. It is interesting to me that those numbers never get mentioned. I mean, there's never a headline that says China's engaged in a, a huge diplomatic <laughs> build-up, right? Now, I understand there's some practical reasons for that, but I do think it's important to keep that, that context in mind. Um, look, Corey, can I go to you, my colleague? Uh, you might like to read out, Peter, a question from our online audience, if there are any. Yep, um, I've got one from, from Glenda. Glenda Corporeal. Um, can you give us some more specifics on where the money on equipment is being spent, mainly in naval capacity or also in missiles? Can you give an assessment of how the extra spending is translating into specific types of equipment and what this might mean? Uh, well, I don't have the numbers, but I, I do understand that it's mostly naval capacity is where China's been spending the most in terms of the official budget. Um, and then, of course, the US suspects it's spending a lot more stuff on um, communications, compu high power computing type of. Um, 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 capabilities, um, satellites, space, and things like this. Um, but the big switch has been towards naval capacity, and that makes sense in terms of its economic needs. We were talking about before with the supply chain from the Middle East. Um, yeah. You got another one there, Corey? Uh, yep, there's one from Ian Lee. Um, there is another important factor that contributes to Chinese military modernization. China is the biggest and, it says, best manufacturer of ships, drones, among other key military equipment. What are your points of view? So what's the question? <laughs> Not quite sure. I, uh, I think it's um, it relates to its manufacturing capacity on, on those things. Um, yeah. And how that would relate to its yeah. So I think it touches on the area of what's military and what's not, and and this would be one of the U.S. concerns. You know, this they one of the so for example, one of the concerns of the U.S. I'm not going to put drones, but take ships. Right, we know that the Chinese um, PLA Navy has a large number of very new sort of small size, but but still lethal kind of ships with you can carry missiles. But um, they kind of look at those number of ships and say, well, we need dockyards to support all this. Navy, right? Where are the dockyards, and how's that built into the into the budget? And it's not there. You see, so that's these kind of things. They look at that industrial, military, industrial capacity, is what leads them to think that China's um, uh, actual defence spending is much larger than than either my number or the Cipri number, whether you adjust it or not. And um, so, wh what I'm taking from that question is this connection between China as a manufacturing hub, right? and its ability to do produce equipment um, and subsidise that manufacturing hub and get the sort of um, civil um, military fusion that uh, Australia doesn't have, for example. Another question from the room, perhaps. If not, I've certainly got another one. Yeah. Thanks, James. Thanks, Peter. <coughs> I, I'm James. My question to you, Peter, is has anyone produced what you consider to be a persuasive or tenable monetary estimate of what the civil military fusion advantage would be if it was official defence spending? Yeah, that was the Senator Sullivan from Alaska's estimate. Um, they, he, so we assume that includes the civil military fusion estimates from the CIA and, and we um, assume that it also does a PPP adjustment, so it looks at labour costs and other kind of costs and they come up with 700 billion. So seven ninths of the USA, but actually, so there's a there's now a movement in the US to say, well, you can't just make these announcements and not tell us how you got there. We need to inspect this. So there's a, a bill being passed through Congress for greater transparency, so that the uh, Defense Department will have to produce a report on China's spending every year that sort of breaks down what they think it is, uh, taking all these things into account. So that will be interesting once it uh, comes out. Any more from the audience here? Corey, online? I've, or I could go for one. If not, I've, I've certainly got one. Um, there are a few online. Um, some of these are not quite relevant to your economic Sure. Account. Well, let me jump in there. Yep. Peter, I know you were in Washington. You did a bit of a roadshow through Washington towards the end of last year. What was the reception you got from the Washington audience to, to your findings? Oh, yeah, thanks, James. Actually, very much along the lines of what we we're just discussing with the, well, but does this take into account the civil military fusion? How do you estimate that kind of stuff? And of course, I have to sort of say, well, look, um, we can take it into account. If you tell me what the number is, I'll, I'll adjust it for you, right? But a lot of, lot of interest, I think, um, a lot of concern. Also, conversations about um, Australia came up as well, right? Um, and that's very interesting. I think um, 
you know, we're talking now about AUKUS and whether it's feasible and what might be ongoing forward. So the view in Washington is, um, I think the view in Washington is they want to see, um, well, we have some people here who probably know it better, but I think the view in Washington, what I've heard is that they want to see Australia make a commitment to defence. They're happy to see Australia make a commitment to defence. They just don't want to be seen as a free rider. They don't particularly care what it is, right? They just want to see the commitment. They want to know that we're sort of in in some way and that we're pulling our weight Right, but whether that's whether that's in missiles or submarines or you know other types of, of operations, I don't. Whether it's tightly aligned with the US or or just sort of somewhat independent, I don't think they care about it too much. What they're really happy to see is a country that's just taking the situation seriously and putting in its own resources and not relying on the good old USA to come to, to their aid if things go wrong. So um, that was kind of an interesting takeaway um, as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interest, and of course, what you get in the USA is you get different groups with different um, access to grind, so there's some institutes there are very much about small government, and so they'll, their natural position is well, we don't want the government wasting taxpayers' money on on big militaries, so let's let's not worry about the China threat too much, right? And then you get other ones who are um, sort of more um, right wing, but not actually anti government, and so they're the ones that sort of see the situation as this is something we need to do something about, and they're very happy to take my numbers, yeah. Have you had any chats to Chinese colleagues about these numbers? Would you are you planning a roadshow through Beijing <laughs> this year with these I'm numbers? Not planning a roadshow through Beijing, and I haven't had too many. Uh, I mean, look, to be honest, um, people tend to shy away when I try and engage Chinese colleagues with this topic. They don't feel comfortable talking about it. Yep. Okay. a decade and a half ago, um, a factoid that was trotted out quite often to, to, to talk about China's internal policing expenses and, you know, uh, for the sake of st stability, internal stability, uh, was to say that uh, China spent more money on its internal stability, that is, st stability maintenance project, than on its defense spending. That was like 10 or you know, 15 years ago. Is that still the case, or has that balance been tipped? Well, it's an excellent question, because the answer is nobody knows, right? And the right reason no one knows is because China won't tell us, right? So if I was doing a roadshow in China, the message I'd be trying to say is, look, please just open your books, right? Tell us what you're spending on. We understand, right? Because if there really is no strategic threat, then we'd be able to see that the, all the things they're spending on are things like you know, paramilitary forces oh, to... People arrived at that comparison <laughs> many so, years ago. So people take guesses, right? Oh. They, 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 yeah, they take numbers here and numbers there and, and do estimates and things like this. But the, thing, the fact is we don't know for sure. Even my numbers, we don't know for sure. They've taken some from some source, some from another source, tried to piece it together. So a little bit of detective work is involved. But China... So every country reports to the United Nations every year, well actually not every country, but many of them do, report to the UN every year their military budget. And there's three forms you can fill out. There's one form that's got everything very, very detailed. There's another form with a little bit less detail, but still quite a lot of uh, information. And the third form is you just put three lines, personnel, operations, and equipment, right? And that's the... F now the idea is that if you're Fiji, you've just filled out the little... The, the, the three-line one, right? But if the USA, you fill out the more detailed one. And of course, China just fills out that three-line one, right? So they could be much, much more transparent. And that would, I think, give you know, people um, you know, some um, relief if they were a bit more transparent. Okay. Look, I'm quite... Is there any final questions? Yeah. Yep, sure. Uh, thanks, Peter. I, I just... Uh, I, I realise that it's the fact that there's not a, another country that compares to China that is why we're here talking about it. But if you had to pick one other country, which one would you pick and where are those points of comparison or difference? So which country is most like China? In terms yeah. Well, the, other big, uh, the other two big countries are, China, uh, are India and Russia. Yeah. And um, India is um, also making you know, rapid growth in its military as well. Um, India imports a lot of its equipment from Russia, right? Although it's not kind of aligned with Russia in, in that way. So that's kind of an interesting situation. Um, India's also got a lot of naval capacity and will continue to invest rapidly in its naval capacity because it's got its own interests in the Indian Ocean. When so I think, th so um, a person who I very much admire is, is Hugh White, um, a great scholar, and he's, uh, his latest book talks about this a lot. So. What's the future of our region? Because so the, these big players are here, you see, China and India. 
Um, and and so he looks us at Australia like it being the sort of Switzerland of of the South Pacific, and, and sort of between all these big players, just trying to be nice to everybody and keep our keep our heads down. Um, that's his that's his kind of scenario. Um, but the fact is that yeah, China and India tell us we look at that the world is changing rapidly, and these countries are going to exert a lot more influence um, politically, but also with hard power as well. In fact, I was just listening to a podcast with Hugh White and he was asked a very similar question. He nominated India and Indonesia. Um, and in his view, the fact that we have some other big players in the region is going to make Australia's job easier, not easy, <laughs> easier compared with if it was just us and it was just just China. Indonesia is really interesting. I mean, it has all the potential to be a big player, but it just doesn't seem to show much interest at the moment. So I think it's more long-term, whereas India is... is it's got its own strategic challenges with China in particular, but also Pakistan, right? And so it's it's investing in, in its military the ways we're not seeing Indonesia is just sort of, yeah, laying back at the moment. <laughs> okay. Look, let's wrap things up there, folks. Um, it was a real pleasure ha having you here today, Peter. You know, I, I love a, a discussion that revolves around some very carefully researched facts. What I'll say about Peter's research, if you read the full papers, is that I can assure you he does the best job possible with the data that is available. So congratulations on, on the work you've done. And I hope today we've been able to um, publicise that work and also put some relevant context um, around it to inform Australia's um, public discussion of China. That's what we're really all about here at the Australia-China Relations Institute. So thank you, Peter, for contributing to that. And thank you to our audience in the room and online for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.